Okay, so uh, I should now be recording. So um, welcome everyone once again to this uh, third installment of the uh, AIM RSF series on learning how to use R, specifically on learning how to wrangle your data using uh, the packages dplyr and tidy R. And so just a little bit of a summary of what we talked about last week. Uh, so we covered, um, you know, getting started with data in R last week. So we talked a little bit about what tidy data are. So just to remind you or, you know, to tell you if you weren't here last time, tidy data is a kind of structure of data that we are using um, where each variable of our data is a column. Each observation is a row, and each cell contains only one observation. So this is something that is quite widely used in R and has um, various benefits that um, if you'd like to know more about, we can talk about later. Uh, so we talked about tidy data um, and why they're use a useful format to be using for our data. We saw how to read data into R with the read underscore CSV function from the reader package. Uh, we also talked a bit about uh, data frames, uh, what they are, how to manipulate them, how to subset them. And we also talked a bit about factors, uh, which is the data structure that R uses uh, to allow us to work with categorical data. And we saw how to create those factors, how to change the levels uh, within a factor, how to change their order or how to change their name. And we also talked a little bit about um, ordered and unordered factors. So today what we're going to talk about is uh, data wrangling, as I mentioned. So we'll learn how to manipulate our tibbles or data frames. Um, so we'll learn how to subset our columns uh, in a data set or our rows. We'll learn how to create new columns. Uh, we'll also learn how to use something called a pipe, um, which allows us to link the output of one function to the input of another function. Uh, we'll see a little bit uh, of how to combine data sets using join. And we will learn how to reshape a data frame from a long to a wide format with a pivot wider function. And we'll also see how to export data frames. This is quite a lot of stuff to cover. I'm being a little bit ambitious today. So um, if you, yeah. If you feel like things are going too fast at some point, please do let us know and we will, you know, slow it down. So, um, and now what I will do and what I would like all of you to do is uh, navigate to the folder which contains the R project file and the various folders that we created um, in the previous sessions. And I want you to open RStudio by clicking on this project, uh, our project file twice. So once you do that, um, RStudio will open. And if you look at the top of your screen, you should be able to see that um, this uh, project has been opened in RStudio. This is really important for being able to read in uh, data in my in our project. So please make sure uh, that you have done that and that you have created um, this folder structure um, that you either saw in the previous sessions or that I emailed you about. So you want to have um, the scripts folder, this data raw folder, data clean folder, and within the data raw folder, you want to have uh, the COVID data. Um, if you haven't been able to do any of those things, please do say so in the chat or in the HackMD, um, and hopefully Raphael can help you with that. Okay, so I'm just going to get started by creating a new script. So I'm going over here to this icon uh, with the file and the 
big uh, cross and I'm going to create my new R script. I'm going to save it immediately uh, into my scripts folder. So it opens this wizard for me. Uh, make sure that you click on the scripts folder that we created. Um, and I will give this a sensible name like data wrangling demo and I will save it. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do is, um, as I mentioned last time, load in the packages that we will be using today. So the first, sorry, the first uh, package, which we've mentioned a few times um, in these workshops is the tidyverse package. So I have written library, opened it closed parentheses and written tidyverse within the parentheses. And now to run this, I need to click on command and enter, uh, command and return or control and enter. Uh, and you will see something like this uh, in the console. I mentioned I'm being ambitious today. I'm also going to try to make up for, la for uh, last time and show you a little bit about dates um, and the package that uh, we need to work with dates in the tidyverse is something called lubridate. Oops, lubridate. Um, you don't need to install this separately. It is part of the tidyverse, so it has already been installed if you installed uh, the tidyverse, but it's not one of the packages that um, the tidyverse automatically uh, loads once you run the library tidyverse command. Uh, well, you can see which packages um, tidyverse automatically uh, loads and lubridate is not one of them. So we need to load up um, lubridate uh, independently. And I'll just add a comment here to say uh, what I'm doing, which is load packages. Okay, so now that we have that, uh, we'll need to um, read our data in again. Uh, so our data that is over here in the data role folder. So code data. Uh, so remember the function that we need to read in our data is read underscore CSV, not the read dot CSV function, which I know is a little bit confusing. This is not the one we want. This is the one we want with the underscore. So read underscore CSV. And what I need to do now is um, give an argument to my function, the argument that the read underscore CSV function requires is the path to uh, the file that I am trying to open. So my path is data underscore raw. So the folder in which the data is stored and the name of the data set. So COVID underscore, sorry, COVID hyphen data dot csv and if i now run this command we'll see our data appear in the uh, environment uh, apologies if there is a noise in my background my partner is making some tea <laughs> um all right so we have successfully uh, read in our data i will take uh, a brief second here to check that everyone was able to do that because if you have not been able to do that um you will struggle to follow along with the rest of the workshop so yes i'm seeing some check marks some thumbs up that's great more check marks amazing okay wonderful yeah i just don't want to lose anyone <laughs> at this point that would be terrible <laughs> okay great so uh, just to remind ourselves, let's have a look uh, at this data set uh, with uh, glimpse, just to see what we have. So we have uh, 53 observations and 11 variables. Uh, these are our variables over here. You may remember from the previous um, workshop that this dollar sign is a notation that allows us to access um, each column of our uh, data set as um, 
vector. So if we type country dollar sign, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, uh, we start with the, with the data frame or table. So COVID underscore data and then dollar sign to access something within it. So for example, country, and we run that. Uh, we will get uh, all the values in the vector country that is contained within the COVID data um, data frame. All right. So yeah, something that I would like to point out here is something that we also noticed last time that uh, there is something wrong with um, this variable country. It clearly contains more than countries. Obviously, Africa is a continent. That is something we will deal with later. So yeah, if I run Glimpse again. So this is what Glimpse tells me. So it gives me a high level um, understanding of my data set, uh, you know, the data types, uh, the first few values that can fit in my console. Um, another uh, function that we saw last time that is helpful for getting an understanding of our data sets is the summary function. So if I look at that, um, we mentioned that this is a very handy uh, command when you have a lot of numerical data. So I always like running uh, something like glimpse or summary uh, when I first get access to a data set just to get you know like my head around what data I am working with. Um, and also to see, you know, is there something strange with this data? Obviously, today we'll be cleaning our data. So it's useful to know what we need to fix. Um, so is there anything that um, um, someone would like to, um, that someone can see as being wrong uh, or strange uh, with this data set? Uh, you can type it in the chat or you can raise your hand and speak. Yes, that is correct. There are indeed some negative uh, weekly counts, uh, which is quite strange. I honestly have no idea uh, how this happened or what it means. And that also translates to some weirdness in the uh, rates for, um, you know, the fortnightly rates where we have some negative um, rates, which is quite strange. Um, this also gives us a nice overview of how many uh, observations are uh, marked as NAs. Uh, remember from the first workshop, NA and R um, is missing data. So we can see that uh, for this variable uh, note, uh, it's all missing. Uh, there are 53,074 rows in this data set. And for this uh, variable, they are all missing. So this is essentially an empty, uh, an empty column. It's doing nothing in our data set. You can also see that there are some missing values over here in my weekly count and in my cumulative count in the uh, fortnightly rate. So these are all good things to be aware of. And one thing that I like to do um, to get an idea of what kind of data I am missing is use the is an A command, which we saw uh, very briefly in the first workshop. So if you remember the is an A uh, command returns me a vector uh, that says true for every value um, that is missing and false for every value in a vector that is not missing. So if uh, I type is dot an A and uh, COVID, data and dollar sign uh, cumulative count, for example, which we saw has 10 uh, missing NAs. So it returns, you know, 53,000 values of mostly falses, and there will be some trues in there. Obviously, that's a very difficult thing to parse because um, no 
person, I think, can just look at 53,000 rows of something and be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so what I want to find out is which of these observations are N, A, R missing. So um, if I just type which, and then within that, I ask which uh, observations are missing uh, in my vector of cumulative uh, count within my COVID data data frame and return this. What it tells me is the indices of all of the values within this vector that are NAs that are missing. Um, which is quite handy to have these indices because remember uh, with the square notation that we saw last week, we can use those indices to, um, well, to, to return to subset um, the, the rows um, in which these um, missing values occur and where they appear. Uh, and the way in which we do that is by typing the name of our data set, so COVID data, opening and closing square parentheses. Uh, and I'm just going to be a little bit lazy and I'm going to just copy this and paste it. So this is a little bit difficult to look at. So if this was a little bit confusing to follow, basically what I'm doing is I'm, you know, I'm accessing this specific column of my data set with this dollar sign notation. Uh, and then I'm asking, um, and then I'm asking uh, which of these uh, values are missing and in what location can I find them? <laughs> um, and then I'm taking these things, these indices that uh, this values returns and I'm going to um, return those uh, rows. So if I run this, it returns the, the rows in which those missing values occurred. And I know this is, this is difficult to look at, uh, but you know, if it is, um, you know, it's, it's equivalent to typing something like COVID data, and you know, just return me the the first of these um, rows. It is equivalent to doing this just in a in a more well automated way, kind of. Instead of telling it, you know, I want you to return me these specific rows, I'm telling it return me the rows which contain missing values in this um, variable. So hopefully uh, that was understood. Uh, if not, uh, please do uh, write us uh, in the HackMD uh, what was confusing and we'll try to help you. Um, but yeah, basically that was just like something that I like to do um, to find out what missing values I have in my data set and see where they're missing from. Just, it helps me uh, to do my data cleaning. Um, Okay, so we noticed from the summary uh, function that, and I'll just try it again, that uh, my entire note um, variable is empty. So what I would like to do is I would like to get rid of it really, wouldn't I? Because it's doing nothing for me other than taking up space. Um, so we saw last time uh, that we could um, do that by, using the square notation, square brackets notation that I just show you, right? So we could just say, uh, R, I want you to only give me um, the first 10 columns of the data set because uh, that note uh, variable was the last one, the 11th one. So if I just run this command, uh, it will return me the first 10 columns without uh, the notes um, variable. Something that I didn't show you last week, uh, I forgot, sorry, is that you can also tell R which column you would like it to not return. So you can use this minus symbol to say, give me back everything except for column 11. So if I run this again, uh, I get exactly the same output as telling it to give me the first 10 
columns or to not giving me the 11th column. So that's how you would do it in base R. Uh, now I will show you how to do this using uh, dplyr. Yeah, Tim. I'm sorry, quick question, um, Irini. The, it, within the square brackets, you haven't got a comma to indicate rows and columns. My understanding of the, of the square brackets is you need the comma to say, and the things before the comma are the rows and the thing after the comma are the columns. So this is kind of like a shorthand notation. Um, I guess people mostly want to access columns. So if you don't add any comma, it will return the first, uh, it will return the columns. Uh, so typing this and typing. So the default setting with yeah. no comma is column, yeah. basically. Okay. So the, these are uh, identical. Helps my brain to put the comma in, I think. So I <laughs> remember. <laughs> that is fair enough. Honestly, I think it would help me as well because the square bracket notation always confuses me because I don't remember which one is which. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. Okay, so um, now I will show you how to do this uh, using a dplyr function, um, which is the select function. So um, I need to give at least two arguments to this function. The first argument is uh, the data set uh, that I am trying to access. So in this case, uh, COVID underscore data. And then I want to tell um, R which columns with, from within that data set I want it to return to me. So I separate those arguments with a comma. And now instead of writing, you know, the index, uh, you know, is it the first column? Is it the fifth column? I'm going to just select that um, with its name. So um, if I wanted to say, I only want um, the first until the 10th columns, I could say I want the columns from um, country until source. And if I now run this, um, again, it returns the same thing. You can see that now we have um, 10 variables. Uh, the node is no longer there. Um, and I can do something quite similar uh, that I showed you here, that you can just say I want COVID data minus 11. Uh, I can also say I want from COVID underscore data to not have note. And again, that returns uh, a table that has 10 variables uh, without the node. So I like this way um, partly because I find it easier to remember uh, the names of the, um, of the columns than the indices. Uh, you can also use the names uh, with the square brackets, um, but yeah, so this is how you would do it with this uh, select function from, um, yeah, from dplyr. And you can also select uh, multiple um, columns. They don't need to be, you know, uh, one next to each other. Like they need to be, uh, to use this colon notation that says start over here and end over there. You can also just select, uh, you know, whichever columns you would like. So if from my COVID data, uh, data frame, I wanted to select, let's say the country, the continent, the population and the weekly count, I could just uh, run this and I will now get back a table that only has four variables, the ones that I asked for. So country, continent, population and weekly count. All right, um, so that is how you can select only um, columns. I will now show you how you can select uh, specific rows. Uh, you do that in R using a function called filter. And filter works fairly similarly to select. So you open and close parentheses, you type the name of the data set that you want to access. And then you tell R um, on what kind of like logical conditions you would like to filter your data. 
So for example, I might want to um, keep all the observations that came from a specific country. Let's say um, I want all the data that came from Cyprus. So this is how I would write this. Um, again, I write my data set. I separate my arguments with a comma. And here I write my logical kind of like condition that needs to be met. And what this means is that the variable country, uh, its value needs to be identical to, this is what these two uh, equal signs mean, to this character string of Cyprus. And if I now run this, uh, you see that I get back uh, a table um, that only has two, that only has 258 observations. Uh, they are the observations that I have for um, the country of Cyprus. So that is how you would do that. Um, in case you're not familiar with these like logical kind of like operators, there um, I have linked in the resources a um, yeah, a web page that uh, has a list of the various um, uh, logical operators that you can use. Uh, but another common one is, for example, if I wanted to, let's say, um, keep only the data that is not about Cyprus, the way I would write it is uh, this way. So instead of having two uh, equal signs, I now have an exclamation mark and an equal sign. Uh, the exclamation mark um, in kind of like this logical notation, uh, logical operators uh, means not. Um, you can also have like your normal ones, like, you know, um, bigger than or smaller than, you know, like so, or like, or like so. Uh, and you can combine them with the equal sign as well. So you could have it's something like this or something like this. And I'll just um, comment these out so R does not complain. But yeah, if you're not familiar with these, please do check out that resource uh, at the bottom of the HackMD to get an idea of what other logical operators there are. Um, Let me think a little bit. Um, yeah, so another thing that I wanted to show you is that you can combine these uh, logical conditions that need to be met. So if I, for example, wanted to only uh, keep data that come from Cyprus uh, and is about positive cases as opposed to deaths, which is uh, what that indicator variable uh, tells me. Um, how would I do that? So let's start with filter, COVID data, which is my data set, and then I can add my logical conditions. So same as before, the country needs to be Cyprus, uh, and then I could say, and um, the indicator needs to be cases, um, and um, let's say the weekly count needs to be over 50. So if I now run all of this, um, you can see that I get uh, an even smaller data set than before. Uh, this only returns 102 observations, the ones that meet those criteria, uh, criteria that I set out. So I only get information about cases um, and only about weeks where the, you know, the weekly count uh, was over 50. Because, so, yeah, because most of the times that we have multiple conditions, multiple logical conditions that need to be met, um, we want all of them to be true. We want this 
end um, logical kind of like operator, that is the default um, in this filter command. So if I were to write filter COVID data country equals equals Cyprus, and now instead of instead of um, the ampersand, write comma, and then indicator equals equals cases, comma, weekly count larger than 50. This returns uh, exactly the same data set as before. So when you just type comma, uh, R assumes that you mean ampersand. Uh, if you did want um, a different behavior of not end, but for example, or, um, the operator that you would need there is um, this, oops, this uh, symbol over here. So for example, let's say I want uh, COVID data um, that is from either Cyprus, or is from, let's say, Greece, I would type it like so. So I would say, yeah, filter this data set and return any observations that meet one of these conditions. So if I do this now, you'll see that I also get some data about Greece over here. All right, uh, was everyone able to follow that? Can I see some thumbs up uh, or green checks? Yep, nice. All right, um, if someone is struggling, please do let us know uh, in the HackMD. Um, I wanted to check because I will now show you something a little bit complicated. <laughs> um, so if this gets confusing at any point, uh, please just uh, tell us and uh, I will repeat whatever was confusing. Okay, so I've mentioned a couple of times that I don't like that um, this country variable contains information that is about continents. There is an easy way to fix that. I could just rename <laughs> my uh, variable to be something else. So. Um, I could rename it to be um, COVID data. So I'm using a function uh, called rename, which is quite convenient. Uh, it's a, an easy one to remember if you're trying to rename something. And I could just say, um, instead of country, I want this variable to be called um, country and territory and say that I want this to replace this. So this is how you would write it. Uh, first, you write the new name that you want to assign, and then you write um, the name that you want to replace. And if I run this, I'll see that uh, this variable has now been renamed to be country and territory instead of just country. Um, you can actually use this within a, a select function as well. So you could just say uh, select COVID, COVID data and say that you're selecting a few variables that you want to keep and one of them is country. Um, country, continent, weekly, or something. Uh, so you could here do, like you could smush those together and say within that select function, country and territory equals country, continent and weekly count. And if I run this, you see that I've selected only these three 
variables that I wanted and that country has now been renamed to country and territory. So that is a handy kind of like trick, uh, kind of like a shortcut to do two things at the same time. Um, but I'm going to be difficult and say that conceptually, I don't like that there is data both for countries and for continents. To me, those should perhaps be two different data sets. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is uh, get rid of the data that refers to continents, right? So what I want to do is I want to filter out all the observations that come from, you know, an area that is not a country. Okay. So first, uh, the first thing I need to do is I need to figure out which of the, you know, observations uh, within my within my data uh, come from countries and which come from not countries. Um, and I don't know if you noticed this, but um, let me just um, print the values of this vector, COVID data country. So Algeria, Africa total. Um, you can see that for places that are not just one country, but like a collection of countries, there is this word over here that is a bit of a, you know, um, telltale uh, word uh, that tells us this is not just one country, it is more than one countries. So if I could find all the observations that have this word total uh, in the country variable, then I would be able to, to get to the observations that I want. Um, so what I'm going to use is a function from the here, a function from the stringer package, which allows me to um, manipulate or work with uh, character data. You don't need to install or load this package. This is one of the default tidyverse packages. And I'm just going to show you one function from it. Um, but it is a very handy package to know if you work with any kind of text data. So the function I'm going to use is the function string subset. Oops, I misstepped that. String subset. And at the same time, I will type this in the help. Um, so you can have a look um, at what this does. So, okay, I need at least two arguments here. I want the string where I want to look for something, which in this case is COVID data dollar sign country. This is where I want to search. And the pattern that I am looking for uh, is this total thing that I found. So if I run this, it returns all the observations within uh, the country variable that have the word total. So I can see that it's picking up on, yeah, Africa, America, Asia, uh, the EU, and so on and so forth. Okay. Great. So these are kind of like continents or, you know, like the EU. Um, what I would like to keep, and I will show you why in a moment, is all the observations that are countries. So now what I'm going to add here is um, information about this argument, uh, this negate argument, where if I add it, I will basically say, okay, within this vector of country in the COVID data, look for the pattern total and give me everything that doesn't have this pattern, okay? So I want you to return me all the countries, not the continents. So I'm going to say negate equals true. And now if I run this, I am getting back countries, Andorra, American Samoa, Algeria, Afghanistan, Albania. Excellent. Okay, 
So now I'm getting closer to being able um, to filter uh, those things that I want. Um, all right, so let's see how I'm going to do this now. So filter COVID data like before. And now I want to write my logical condition on what I want to filter. So we saw these various operators of you know, the two equal signs. Um, could say that I could use those two equal signs. That's not going to work uh, because those expect only a single value, a single character string. And I have multiple of them. Um, oh, right. Um, Yes, and I want to, sorry, I, I, skipped, I skipped a few steps. Um, basically, to make this vector here a little bit easier to read, I will also do one more thing, which is um, wrap this thing around it. And what this will do is it will give me all of the unique values uh, of this vector. So if I run this, I get back a much more reasonable um, set of values. It's still a lot of stuff. It's still like 222 uh, values, but it is better than, you know, like 50,000 or something. Uh, so these are the names of all the countries that are represented in my, um, in my data set. And what I will do now is I will save this in a vector called countries. And I will say that I want to keep only the um, observations in the country variable where the value also exists in, the, in this countries um, vector. Okay, so that was a lot, uh, and this is quite a confusing operator, but basically what this uh, logical condition here says is, okay, go through every single value of my vector. Okay, the first value is Afghanistan. We know this because we've seen this a few times. Okay, great. Now go look in this vector called countries and see, is Afghanistan in there? If yes, keep it. If not, discard it. Um, and we know that Afghanistan is in this um, uh, vector here. So Afghanistan is kept, Albania is kept, Algeria is kept. But everything that isn't here, so for example, Africa total, America total, and so on and so forth, all of those things are discarded. Okay, so that was the complicated thing that I wanted to explain. Um, how are people feeling? Feeling was that was that okay? Were you able to follow that? Yeah, just about Irini. Uh, the percentage in percentage. That's just uh, I haven't quite caught up with that little bit yet. But that is just a logical operator, is it? That means it's just, yeah, in. exactly. It is just a logical operator that tells R to look for values in a vector. Yeah. Yeah. All right, great. Um, so I'm gonna show you one more thing and then we'll do a bit of an exercise. Um, so the thing that I would like to show you is uh, the pipe that I mentioned at the beginning. So let's, okay, how do we do this? Um, all right, so I now have this, uh, I have done this, which allowed me to filter out um, all of the observations that come from um, uh, continents or collections of countries. Um, but this is not the only cleaning, you know, operation that I want to do on my data. We've already mentioned that I also want to exclude the column um, note, right, because it is empty. So 
how would I go about doing that? Um, you know, how would I do both of those things to my data set? So one thing that I could do is I could save the output of uh, this onto a new data set. So I could call this COVID data countries and assign this output that I'm seeing over here onto this data set. So if I run this, I see that, yes, I have a new, um, a new um, data set over here that, that has appeared in my environment. Uh, and it is indeed, you know, like smaller <laughs> than my COVID data one. So yes, some values are missing. Excellent. Um, all right. So now that I have this COVID data countries data set, I can, you know, I can do something on that data set. So I could say, um, right, uh, select COVID, sorry, COVID data countries and say, please return everything there except for the note variable, right? Because we said that it is empty. So I can now do that and I get um, this shorter data set that doesn't have the data from uh, the continents and it is also um, a little bit um, narrower <laughs> in the sense that it's also missing one of its variables, uh, the note one. Okay, so I could do that. Uh, another thing, so solution one, um, interim data sets. Um, something else that I could do, which is called nesting, is I could, I could do both things at the same time. So I could say, okay, yes, I'm filtering my COVID data to only contain the country observations that are found within this um, country's vector. And after I've done that, I also want to select all variables except for the note variable. Okay, so this is kind of like the data set where I want to do that selection. So I could treat all of this thing as this thing over here. So I could do this. And if I run this, um, this also works. And again, it returns the, the same data set as before. I find this very difficult to read. Um, this is what in linguistics we would call a center embedding. Um, I have a background in linguistics. Center embeddings are really, really difficult for people to parse in, you know, like normal human languages. And I would argue in programming languages as well. This, okay, I can read it and I can figure it out. But if you wanted to nest like three or four functions like this, it becomes an, a mess that is very, very difficult to parse um, for a person that's reading the code. So the second, the third way that I would like to show you and is the thing that I most usually do is use a pipe. Ooh, three pipe. Um, and this is another strange operator that uh, includes um, uh, percentage points. So the pipe in the, the tidyverse pipe, I should say, is written like this. Uh, percentage sign, larger than sign, percentage sign. Um, so this is a pipe in R. Uh, you can also write it as a shorthand with shift command M uh, in a Mac or shift control, no, shift alt M in a Windows. I'm not sure, um, but yeah, so what does this do? Okay, let's say that we start with just like our data, COVID data. We have our data set and we want to do something to it. We say, take the data set 
and then uh, so you can also type it um, you know slower as in percentage sign larger than sign percentage sign or the shortcut of shift alt shift command m yeah shift command m um, and then say i want to filter uh, and now I don't have to write the data set anymore because it's already over here. R knows that I've already taken this um, and I'm passing it into this function. So now I don't need to write the data set. I just go straight to the logical condition of country in countries. And now that I've done that, I am also going to select everything but note. Okay. So if I now run this, um, it returns uh, the same data set that I got in the previous three uh, attempts uh, or 51,546 observations uh, in 10 variables. So you can read this pipe kind of like operator as a then. So you start with this thing, then you do this thing, then you do this thing. Uh, shift control. Ah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alexander. Um, yeah, so I would highly recommend learning the shortcut for this uh, operator because it has a bit of a pain to type percentage point, percentage sign, bigger than sign, percentage sign every single time. Um, yeah, and you can string as many functions as you want uh, in this way. So if you then wanted to, I don't know, like also rename something, uh, you could just like string it along here and say rename, uh, I don't know what you would rename, but um, yeah, weekly count to weekly n or something. So, and it just does first the filtering, then the selection, and um, then the renaming. All right. So hopefully, hopefully that was okay. Uh, you'll now finally have a chance to um, practice all of those things that I said in a bit of an exercise. Um, so if I go back to my slides, um, what I would like you to do is um, subset the COVID data table such that you keep only observations from the TESI COVID-19 source. So source is the variable here and TESI COVID-19 are some values within that. Um, and I want you to retain only the variables of country, indicator, year underscore week, and weekly count. Uh, I will note that this is a, a character um, variable. So you need to use the quotation marks um, when you do any filtering, say, using this uh, variable. So you have five minutes. I will start the timer now. Um, if you're finished before the time has run out, uh, feel free to give us um, a, a green check. Um, or if the timer has run out and you're still not done, please do give us a, a red X and we'll give you a little bit more time.
Okay, uh, the five minutes are almost uh, over. I can see five green check marks. Um, is that accurate? <laughs> have uh, five of you finished? Uh, are some left over from before? Uh, have some of you forgotten to add one? Okay, I see uh, one X. So we'll make sure to uh, go through the solution. If more people have not managed to finish it, oh, Soraya is having some technical problems with the keyboard. Um, I'm sorry, Soraya. <laughs> um, is, uh, are you not able to type <laughs> or? No worries, you can tell us in the chat if you uh, if you would like Sorry, to. No, yeah, it was that. Uh, I have a Bluetooth keyboard and it stopped working and I couldn't figure out why, so I had to switch. So I'm late, but you may continue. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, Bluetooth keyboards are fun. I also have a Bluetooth keyboard, uh, but I sometimes leave it behind on my desk and go work from the sofa. And on one occasion, my partner just like threw a bunch of things on my desk and like there were there was a ghost writing in my document. And I was like, what is happening? Anyway, uh, cool. So um, the solution to this uh, is fairly short. So what you needed to do was only retain uh, observations that relate to uh, that come from the TESI COVID nineteen. Uh, source, uh, data source. So you need to write that like so. Um, so source equals equals, so is identical to, and then you need to use the quotation marks here. Uh, and after you have done that, um, you can select uh, the variables that I asked you to select of country, indicator, year, week, and weekly count. Did anyone try doing those things the other way around? So uh, selecting first and then filtering. And if you have, if anyone has, could you unmute and tell us what happened, or put it in the chat? I tried uh, the command in the chat. Uh huh. So the uh, and it didn't work because it said uh, that I must use a logical vector, not a character. Hmm. Yeah. So. But must be a logical vector, not a character. Yeah. Um, so, what, yeah, I'm not sure which bit is breaking this, uh, but yeah, you don't need to use the dollar sign notation because um, um, because you're already telling R that um, you wanted to filter the COVID data data set. Uh, it knows where to look, so you don't have to say COVID data dollar sign. Yeah, yeah. Then, so would that matter though? Um, not necessarily. I think it might still work, but you just don't need it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. There's a problem here is that the source that you have written is Tessie without the COVID-19. Um, so there isn't anything called just Tessie without the COVID-19. So the filtering won't work. Um, and then um, because, yeah, you you ask for filtering for those, um, you know, for, for the source of Tessie, and then it's just separated by commas for the various variables. Uh, you don't say that you want to select those variables, right? So filter is for the um, uh, for selecting rows, and select is for selecting columns. So you need both of those. Um, um, yeah. Here, uh, Alexander says you created a new data set for only Tessie. Uh, ooh, the dollar, the percentage sign in percentage sign thing, and weirdly gives a different amount of rows. Um, yeah, so this operator of the dollar sign in and dollar sign is different to the pipe operator of dollar sign bigger than sign dollar sign. Um, so I don't know um, if maybe you, you got those two mixed up. So the dollar sign in dollar sign looks for values in like the, the it looks for values that are in the right hand side. So mm. after the in, in the uh, well, yeah, essentially, 
I mean, your solution was obvious, but I didn't think about that. So instead of using uh, source equal equal uh, yeah. testing for it, I like we did before. I created uh, another data set, and then I had source source yeah source and ask if it was in the other data set, like we did before with countries. So like we did with yeah countries, and then percentage in percentage in countries variable i did the same with with this essentially but this is this is the more obvious way but weirdly enough it gave a different uh, a slightly different output to them i will have to test that later and see what it does because now i'm curious why it doesn't give you the same um the same output um okay and then richard says um so is this the yeah, those, those are the three options on source i think Obviously, if you just search for Tessa, you'll get two and three rather than uh, just them two. I see. Okay, that is that is good to know, right? Um, so that uh, answers your question, uh, Alexander. Thank you, Richard. Um, cool. So yeah, my original question was about whether anyone tried to select before they filter. Um, if you haven't, that's okay. Try it now and tell me what happens and if you understand why that happens. I suppose it won't work because, you know, when you're selecting, you're dropping the source variable itself and then you can't filter based on the source. Yes. That is correct, thank you. So you need to be mindful of what order you ran your commands in, because as I said, this pipe basically means uh, then. So if you do this part before this part, uh, you won't have <laughs> this variable anymore to do your filtering. Um, so yeah, I think people sometimes struggle with this because like it all happens in one go. Uh, and for us, you know, it, it all happens at the same time. Um, but for R, uh, those things happen in sequence. So you do need to keep in mind um, the order in which you, you execute those commands. Okay, um, does everyone understand this solution? Have they got this to work? Unless I see um, an X, uh, I will move on to the next function that we'll talk about today, which is a function called mutate. Uh, so a lot of the times when you're cleaning your data or working with your data, you will want to create a new variable uh, using some information that you already have. So if we look at our COVID data over here, I don't know if I've shown you this before actually. So in your environment, you'll see there is this um, little like blue button with a white triangle. If you click on this button, uh, it will show you the, um, uh, the variables of uh, your data set and you know, like what type they are, how many observations there are and so on and so forth. So I often use this, I, I find it quite handy. Um, so yeah, if we look at uh, the variables that we have in our data set, uh, we'll see that we have um, a biweekly rate. So the rate for um, either cases or deaths for a 14 day period. Um, but let's say that we also want um, a weekly rate. So, uh, you know, the rate for seven day period. Um, so we don't have this already, but the way we would calculate it presumably is with the weekly count uh, of cases and deaths in our data set divided by the population of the country. Uh, so we have both of those pieces of information, so we could calculate it from what we already have. And if I just um, show you the website from where I downloaded this data, which is the uh, European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. Uh, and this is kind of like the web page uh, for the data set that we are using. If we scroll somewhere over here, uh, it tells us uh, what the formula is that they used to calculate the 14 day uh, rate. So we can adjust, uh, adjust this uh, to 
uh, our own uh, weekly rate that we want to calculate. Okay, so the way you do this is, um, as I mentioned, with the mutate uh, function from dplyr. So I'm going to stick with this pipe notation that uh, I showed before because I quite like it. So I'm going to start with my data set and then I am going to pipe this data set into my function. So I'm going to type mutate. Again, I don't need to write uh, the name of my data set here because R already knows which one my data set is. And what I'm going to say is um, the name of the new variable that I want to create, which is weekly rate. So that is the name. And now I will add an equal sign and then write the formula that I am going to use uh, to create um, um, the to calculate the weekly rate. So that is uh, weekly count divided by population. Uh, and I am going to um, also multiply this by 100,000, just going by what the ECDC website uh, describes for how they calculated their um, fortnightly rate, just to be consistent. So if I run this and I look at what I get back, um, you can see that I now have 12 variables, uh, which makes sense. I have added one variable to the ones I had before. And if I look here, um, I mean, this is a little bit too narrow to look at. So I'm just going to pipe this into my um, view command that I showed you before to open this spreadsheet, uh, to open this in a spreadsheet view over here. Um, cool. So if I now uh, go to like, if I scroll to the end of that data set, um, I see my final uh, variable that has been created. It has the name that I asked it to have, uh, and its content are the output of that calculation um, for each of my observations. So I think that is a super handy thing uh, to know how to do when you're cleaning your data. Um, does that make sense? That's kind of all I wanted to say. Um, oh, Tim, thanks for trying that. Uh, and it doesn't work. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Um, if this uh, mutate function is uh, fairly clear to everyone, um, I will move on to another um, function that is very, very helpful. Um, and that is the summarize function. So the summarize function is often used, or I think almost always used uh, in combination with the group by function. And I'll just, um, so basically what this combination of um, functions allows you to do is group your data into you know, smaller well, groups. Um, calculate some kind of statistic for each of those groups and you know put them back into a data set all together. So we're going to see an example of how that works. Uh, and I just want to mention that um, R does let you type summarize in whatever way <laughs> you prefer. So it accepts the British spelling and the American spelling. The main developer behind the Tidyverse package, uh, his name is Hadley Wickham, he's from New Zealand, so he types things the, the British way. Um, all right, so let's see how this works. So let's say that I want to um, look at the minimum and maximum values of, um, I don't know, like, our indicators, so either like cases or deaths uh, by each country. So the way I would do this is I would group my um, data by the country, 
uh, from where they were observed and also by uh, the indicator. Um, and then I would summarize uh, creating two uh, new variables. So I will call uh, one um, max um, country weekly max or something. Um, so that is the name of my new variable and I would call it max uh, weekly count. And I could also have one for uh, the minimum country weekly mean equals min weekly count. Okay. And again, this is a little bit annoying to look at, so I will just type it into a view command and just look at it here. Okay, um, so that hasn't entirely worked <laughs> as it should have, um, but you can sort of get an idea of what this uh, would have been. So it's created um, two rows per country or you know continent or whatever, uh, one for the cases and one for the deaths. And it's created the two variables that I asked it to create over here. Uh, so, you know, the, the weekly maximum for each country for the cases and the deaths and the weekly minimum for each country for the cases and the deaths. But uh, obviously this hasn't worked entirely as I would have liked it to because uh, all of these seem to be uh, NAs. Not all of them, actually. Some, some do have values, uh, but the vast majority of them uh, are in A's. Can anyone uh, suggest why that might be? So I think it's for both the country and indicator. So 121130 is the maximum. Mm -hmm for Austria among the cases and the maximum among the, the indicated deaths is 776? Yes, so indeed for Austria, this is the maximum weekly cases and this is the maximum weekly deaths. And here, and yeah, I mean, the minimum is zero for both of them. So there were some weeks, presumably in early 2020 when there were no cases and there were no deaths. Uh, so for Austria, this has worked, uh, but for the rest of the countries, it hasn't. <laughs> um, so the reason why this hasn't worked is, yeah, uh, as Richard writes in the chat, um, there exist NA values or missing values uh, in my weekly counts. So in the first workshop uh, in week one, we mentioned that NA is this uh, special thing that R has to signify to you that there are missing values in your data. And it won't really let you forget it. You need to explicitly deal with your missing data. Um, so what's happening here is that because say for Afghanistan for one week, they, they're missing data for one week. We don't know for which week, we don't know why. And R is like, as long as there is an NA, uh, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to tell you what the maximum is because it could theoretically have been the NA and the same thing for the minimum. So the way to fix this is to tell R to um, get rid of those NAs. So we did this uh, in the first week by adding a, um, um, an argument in our max, min, or whatever function um, that is, I'll just show you here, max. Um, 
So you can see here in the usage, uh, it shows na.rm. So um, I could add an argument here saying na.rm uh, normally and say true, and that would remove all of my NAs and it would let me uh, actually see the, the maximum values that we have and the minimum values that we have uh, in our data already. Um, Tidyverse also gives us uh, another way of doing this, uh, and I'm going to do that now because it's a little bit easier. So there is a function called uh, drop underscore NA, and if I open and close parentheses, here I can pass as the argument the vector for which I want to get rid of my uh, missing values. So in this case, that is the weekly count because uh, that is the maximum and minimum values that we're trying to calculate with the weekly count. So I'm going to drop all of the missing values from those, and then I'm going to pipe this um, into the rest of my, um, of my cleaning process. And if I now run this, now it works. So now that we have explicitly told our, you can disregard the missing values, um, now we get um, the results that we would have expected to get. So yeah, now uh, we can see that for Afghanistan uh, in the years, I think from the beginning of 20, the data here is from the beginning of 2020, so from January 2020 until June of 2022, uh, the worst week in Afghanistan uh, saw uh, 14,281 positive cases and 681 deaths. Uh, and if we look at, I don't know, um, you know, <laughs> the entire Europe, uh, European Union total, uh, it is something terrible, like almost eight and a half million. Um, and yeah, you can scroll through that and get an idea of, um, how various countries um, coped during the pandemic. You may have noticed that in the console, um, I have gotten this um, kind of message from R saying that the summarize function has grouped my output by country and that I can override this using the groups argument. Generally, this, I get this message because for R, um, these values are still grouped by country. That's not really a visible thing. Like if I just did group by and like looked at my, um, at my data, I wouldn't really see anything different. It's all kind of like in the background. So it's easy to forget when you've grouped something, uh, but it can have consequences um, if you then run something like summarize. So, if you want to always be sure that your data are not weirdly grouped and you have forgotten about it, it's always a good idea to end your, um, you know, like your chain of uh, things that you have done uh, with an ungroup uh, open and close parentheses function. Um, so this doesn't really change uh, the output that I get here. This is all going to be exactly the same as before, but now I no longer get um, that message that I got before about my data being grouped because I have explicitly ungrouped my data now. Um, so that is um, one example of summarize. I would like to show you another one. Um, so, for example, uh, something that I, I would have been interested um, when looking at this data is, you know, how equal are the observations that we have from these different countries? So these are all countries like worldwide, basically, right? Um, do we have equally good data for all of them, equally complete data? So you could check this by seeing, you know, how many observations do I have um, for, say, Germany, as opposed to, I don't know, like, well, we've been looking at Afghanistan, right? Um, so do I have observations for each week um, for uh, each of these countries? 
So one way to do it would be uh, using this summarize function. So if I start with my data and uh, pipe it into a group by uh, function and group my data by country. And then what I want to see um, is the number of observations that I have for each of these countries. So the way to do that, is, the way to get that is to say, um, so I'm going to create another new variable, observations by country equals uh, n. Uh, so this is the thing, this is the function that I use if I just want to count the number of uh, observations. Um, and oops, again, I'm going to ungroup and then I am going to view my output. So this opens over here. Um, so we can see that for Afghanistan, we have 254 observations. For a lot of the countries, we have either 254 or 236 observations. But for some places we have, um, so like for American Samoa, we have 76 observations. Um, for the Cook Islands, we have 36 observations and so on and so forth. Um, I would like to know for which countries we have the most or the fewest observations. And it's a little bit annoying to just like scroll and try to remember which, you know, like the previous highest or lowest number you saw was. So we can also tell R to arrange our data sets in a certain, in a certain order for us. So unsurprisingly, the uh, function for that is called arrange. And I can give it an argument um, which tells it which column, which variable to use uh, to sort, uh, to arrange our uh, values by. Uh, so the one that I am interested in is this observations by country oops, um, that I just created. So I will just paste that in here. And we see that this um, has arranged our, um, our observations, um, but it has put the ones that we have the most observations for on top. Um, and what I want is the opposite. I want to see the ones that have the fewest um, observations at the top. Just run this again. Oh, I see. Okay, cool. Uh, so I was getting a bit confused because um, a range normally um, shows things in ascending order. And I was confused as to why the countries with the most observations were at the top. Uh, it's because I was still uh, seeing the previous view where I don't know if you caught it, but I accidentally clicked uh, on these little arrows that uh, you, know, you can also use to sort things in ascending or descending order. Um, but I wanted to show you how to do that <laughs> with code. So I tried not to draw attention to it. Anyway, clearly I failed. Um, but yeah, if you uh, use the arrange uh, function uh, and pass an argument to it, uh, R will sort your um, data set by ascending uh, order of that uh, variable. You can also tell R to arrange those values in descending order and you do that by typing the desc uh, function for descending and um, putting that around the uh, variable that you want to sort by and then run it again and now we can see that it is in descending order 
Okay. Um, I did also want to show one bit of a shorthand uh, for how to do this summarize, uh, this group by and summarize for um, counting observations specifically. Um, so you can do that. So basically, there is one function that takes these two things, the group by and summarize specifically for counting observations. So this n um, function and smooshes them into one function. And that function is called count. Um, so if I did COVID data uh, and then just wrote count by country, um, that would basically do the same thing. Um, if I just put that to view in a kind of like data set thing. So you see this looks basically the same. Uh, the only thing is that my variable um, is now called n. Uh, I can't really change that. It's part of like the, the shorthandedness uh, of it. So um, you can also use this to basically both group by and count the number of observations for one kind of like level basically of um, um, a factor most of the times. Um, all right. Um, yeah, so there are various ways that you can summarize things. So yeah, you can use this. Um, n command to get the number of observations. You can use the min or um, max. Uh, you can use uh, the mean to calculate averages. Uh, you can use uh, sum to add up all the numbers uh, that exist within a value. So not just count uh, the numbers, but like add them all up together. So if you wanted to like add up uh, the observations for Afghanistan and Albania and Algeria or something, um, you would use that with the, you would do that with the sum function. Uh, and you can also calculate things like SD and so on and so forth. So you can do all sorts of summaries. Um, all right. How are people feeling? I have quite a few more things to talk about actually. Um, so how how tired are people? Are you are you doing okay or would you like to wrap up um, pretty pretty soon? I think this is great Irini, but I think I'm ready to wrap up because I'd like to sort of consolidate commands we've already learned yeah rather than yeah. learning more now it is it is quite a lot of stuff um richard's more enthusiastic than me so. <laughs> I, so i'm enthusiastic but i'd like to kind of go back through it a bit more slowly before learning more yeah no that is um <clears throat> i do have an exercise um it um it does use one thing. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is you don't have to follow along with this uh, and type it. No, no, you do. <laughs> okay, I do have an exercise, but it um, it requires us uh, to know a few more uh, things. So how should I do that? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to show you how to join two data sets together and then we'll do an exercise. Um, hopefully uh, you can still uh, follow along with this. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is uh, we're going to need to download a data set. Um, please, please don't shout at me. Um, <laughs> Hopefully this, this will not be too, too difficult. Um, so if you go to the HackMD, uh, and I will also paste this in the chat. Um, 
if you could uh, copy this and uh, put it and paste it in your console, what it should do is it should download one file that uh, contains information about the dates um, within which a week happened. So if you've seen our data set, it has a variable called um, year week. So basically it tells us, you know, oh, these observations come from the 27th week of 2020, which I found a very difficult thing to think about because I have no idea when the 27th week of 2020 was. So I've just gone online and found a place where it says, okay, the 27th week of 2020 started on date one and ended on date two. So this is what this data set has. And we're going to merge, to smush these two data sets together so we can use this information in our main um, data set. So um, if you, has anyone pasted that command in their console? And um, have you uh, been able to download um, that data set? I will do the same thing actually. So if I go into my console and I just um, paste it and run it, um, you should get something like this back saying it's tried this URL uh, and it downloaded something. And if you go into the files um, in data raw, um, you should see a file called dates.tsv. Yes, it is a TSV file. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I did mention last week uh, that my preferred file format for data is actually a TSV file. You did. I did, I did. Uh, so TSV files are basically like CSV files, but they are tab delimited instead of comma delimited. Um, you will be reassured to see that the command for reading in uh, TSV files is really, really similar to the read CSV uh, function. So read underscore TSV instead of CSV. Um, and like before, I'm going to pass as my argument um, the file, uh, the path to the file and the name of the file. So data underscore raw. Um, forward slash and then dates.tsv. Uh, and that read in my data over here because I haven't saved it in an object. So I'll just save it in an object. Um, and you will see that there is now a data set in my environment called dates. Can I see some? Uh, check marks if people have been able to do this. I see three. I see five. I see six. <laughs> and maybe I will only see six. Uh, how are the rest? Have you um, not been able to do this? Uh, has something gone wrong? Okay, I see one more. Done it, sorry. I used a full stop rather than an underscore between read and TSV. Yes, it is a very, very easy thing to yeah. do. Uh, it's very upsetting that uh, people have decided to call their functions such similar names. <laughs> But great. Uh, okay, why can't I close this window now? Oh, I think I think Zoom is with you, Tim. I think Zoom's like you've had enough. I think you should stop now. Uh, why can't I close this? Okay, fine. All right. So now that we've been able to read this in, uh, what I would like to do is basically combine these two data sets: the dates uh, file and the COVID data file. So. If we look at the states file, you'll see that it has a variable called year underscore week, um, and its values are the year and the month, uh, the year and the week separated by a hyphen. Uh, this is exactly the same way in which uh, the this variable is encoded in my COVID data um, data set. So again, year underscore week, and then week. Uh, year um, hyphen week. 
Okay, so you need to have, if you're going to join two data sets together, you need to have one variable um, that has the same name and has the same values in both of your data sets. And then R can use that um, variable to combine those things uh, correctly. So the function that I'm going to use to do that is uh, join. Uh, specifically, I'm going to use an inner join. And I'm going to give R the names of um, my data sets. Um, so these are COVID data and dates. So the two data sets that I want to combine. And then I'm going to add another argument uh, by equals. And this is the variable that I have made sure is the same between my two data sets. And its name is year underscore week. And I am going to save it, uh, COVID data dates, dates. All right. So if I open this data set now, uh, we'll see that we have uh, more variables than before. These two variables here at the end called from date and to date. Um, so hopefully that was, um, that makes sense. Um, yeah, R just looks at this um, year week variable and just matches the values together. Obviously um, this, um, uh, information had to be repeated, um, right? So like our um, COVID, our dates data set here is a lot shorter, right? It's only 129 observations. And my COVID data data set is 53,000 observations. Um, so for every match that are found uh, in that important variable here, it just added um, the these values. So, you know, we have observations for year week, uh, for uh, 2020 week one, uh, for Afghanistan, for Africa, for um, whatever comes next, uh, for Albania, Algeria, and so on and so forth. So those observations have each been repeated. And there are quite a few join functions um, that you can peruse in your own time to see which ones um, would be the suitable ones for you. Um, and that did take a long enough time that I now don't have time to uh, share the exercise that I wanted with you. Apologies, uh, I did know that this was going to be a little bit too um, ambitious. Um, yeah, that is okay. Um, I think I will just leave it here um, and I will show you one last thing that you need to do the exercise and you can do the exercise um, at home. I'm gonna give you homework this time. Uh, the function I want to show you is uh, about dates. Uh, you can see that here for these two variables, these have uh, the data type of date, uh, which basically just means that R understands that this is a year, this is a month, uh, this is a date, and you can access those things uh, with the function year, month, and day. Uh, so if I say year and then COVID data from date, and I, sorry, and I run this, Oh, um, COVID, the COVID data data set does not have this column. Uh, it is the COVID data dates uh, data sets that has this column. So this returns the years. Um, this returns the month. And this returns the day. 
Um, so this is something that will be useful to do uh, an exercise that is in the slides. Um, I will put all of these things, uh, oops, I will put all of these things um, in the email that I will send you tomorrow with like the resources from today's um, workshop so you can uh, catch up with all of that. Um, yeah, sorry that we run out of time. <laughs> Uh, I will now um, stop sharing. No, I will first stop the.